morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our panel today. Um, so we're going to go. Uh, so I'm Courtney Keebler. I'm the uh, chair of the Education Committee. Um, so we'll go around and introduce everybody on the panel. Um, so we'll start with uh, Tony Barbary. Good morning, everybody. This is Tony. Pleasure to be on. Um, and then we've got Bill Mobius. Good morning, Bill Mobius. I'm with JLL. And then we've got Vicki Rathman. Good morning, I'm Vicki. I'm with Lincoln Harris Corporate Services Group on the healthcare side. And then we've got Christy Walters. Good morning, I'm Christy Walters. I'm a senior property manager at Duke Realty Industrial Properties. And then we've got Mary Stocks, who's gonna be heading up the panel for, our, uh, for the event. Good morning, I am uh, Mary Stocks and I work for HPI. I am in, um, I currently work in office and I've been in the industry for about 10 years. Awesome. All right, well, we'll let Mary get started with questions. Well, good morning. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we, uh, this is a really important topic. I know a lot of managers are grappling with this, have been grappling with this for the last year. Um, and we are, uh, we're basically talking about COVID related expenses today um, and, and what we can do as far as passing them through uh, and so a lot of our managers, this is, this is not something that we've, we've ever dealt with before. And last year was, it seems to be just the beginning. So people are still dealing with it. We don't know how much longer we're going to continue to deal with it, but it is the hot topic of conversation for the foreseeable future. And uh, today we wanted to really just focus on how do you handle uh, COVID related expenses as it relates to operating expenses? What can you pass through? How does this impact, uh, um, how does this impact tenants? How does it impact our owners? And uh, so we wanted to just kind of start off by talking about some of the basics, um, kind of net versus gross uh, leases, uh, base year. And, and so to, to kind of start off with, we wanted to kind of talk about, uh, to get everybody on the same page, we wanted to talk about what gross leases or gross ups are um, are really all about and how that impacts us um, as it relates to COVID. So I'm going to start with, uh, I really wanted to talk, start off with Bill. Um, what is grossing up? Um, what expenses are grossed up? Um, and could you kind of share an example? Because a lot of managers have difficulty understanding this concept and a lot of tenant and well, and it's a lot, it's very difficult for tenants to understand it. It's very hard to explain it to our tenants. So you kind of just start off with talking about gross ups. Uh, sure, thanks, Mary, I'd be glad to. And um, I'm gonna try and share a screen here. So, well, it, first of all, let me just start by saying, um, you know, the goal of gross ups is really to be fair to the tenant and the landlord, because if we don't do that, um, you can have scenarios where it's inequitable either way. You know, and the extreme examples would be if you have a building with very low occupancy and, and you don't gross up, you know, and, and, and you've got a base year scenario, then, um, you know, the, the expenses are going to go up radically as the occupancy increases and the variable expenses go up. The, the idea of the gross up is you're grossing up the base year and the calculation year. So it should normalize things so that it's a truer representation of, you know, the, the, the intent of passing through expenses that increase with occupancy um, or, or expenses that increase in general. So let me, let me give, I'll, I'll give an example if, if I can share my screen here successfully. Yeah, so you should see a, um, a very basic building. Um, it's not a good representation of the building, but the idea is we've, we've got a building that's 100,000 square feet. And so we have one tenant and they occupy uh, 50,000 square feet. So their proportionate share is 50%, pretty basic. So in this case, um, we've got uh, janitorial expenses, which normally are, you know, billed based on the square footage. And so a rate here for, for this example is five cents per square foot per month, including tax. So the total expense for the building would be five cents times that 50,000 feet that's being cleaned um, times the 12 months. So that's $30,000 annually. Now, if we just did a straightforward calculation, you would take the uh, tenant's uh, proportionate share, which in this case is 
multiply it by the, the expense, and they'd pay $15,000. So the question is, is that fair? Um, and I would suggest no, because <clears throat> the whole reason the cleaning cost is what it is is because of the tenant's occupancy. So the idea here is that the gross up can adjust for that. And so what we do is we take, in this case we'll assume we're using a 95% gross up. So you take 95% times the cleaning cost and you gross it up and then you divide it by the actual occupancy, which in this case is 50%. So the gross up cleaning cost is 57000 So now if we take the um, proportionate share of that gross up cleaning cost, we get 28500 So now I would suggest that tenant A is paying their fair share. So that's a really basic uh, gross up calculation example. Um, sometimes that works for people to help them get the idea of why this is being done. Um, and, and that's really the goal of the gross ups is to uh, just normalize the expenses um, so that you know, the the tenants are paying their fair share and so forth. So I hope that's helpful. Um, there's a few other points here, and, and also would like to um, give Tony a chance to weigh in, too. But, um, you know, the idea of if you don't have gross-up language in a lease, if you go by the, you know, the rationale that was just presented, um, you could make an argument that, you know, it still should be done. Obviously, that's trickier. If the ch tenant challenges you, then you're in a dispute and so forth. So um, it, it is important, in my opinion, to have, um, you know, language of some kind in the lease that refers to um, adjusting expenses for occupancy. And I would, I would say most leases, most office leases uh, typically have that. Um, another point that we wanted to cover was what does fully occupied mean, and I think we'll touch on this some more, but, um, you know, in most cases I think we're used to seeing that the least occupancy, that is the occupancy per the rent roll is what's used, and, and that's easy, um, it's defensible, you know, we've got those numbers month by month, et cetera, and um, it's a straightforward calculation. The problem during this COVID time, obviously, is even though the building's um, have stayed leased for the most part, the occupancy has been, you know, way down. I mean, it's 10, 20 percent, you know, sometimes more than that, but um, so it's very different. So, you know, we're going to address possible ways to deal with that. Um, and then just finally, uh, another point on gross up, sometimes they're 95 percent, sometimes they're 100 percent. I've even seen 97 and a half percent. And, um, you know, the the key there is, in my opinion, is um, any of those numbers can work. The key is that it's applied consistently and that it's done for the base year and the subsequent calculation years in the same way. So um, that's just a quick run through of some of the points you know I wanted to cover on gross ups and I'll defer to uh, Tony and anybody else that wants to add something. Well, I had a question um, across the various types of uh, commercial real estate. So Vicki, uh, is, is, is gross up something you typically see in medical office buildings as well? I know Christy um, has some, uh, some good points about industrial as far as these gross ups, but what are you seeing, uh, Vicki? What's, what, what's pretty standard in terms of medical office building? So I think the medical office buildings really run the same as a commercial as when we're talking about gross ups. So it follows the lease space generally again it's the same with um, COVID now we're really looking at what occupied means mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very similar to what we're seeing in commercial and and Christy uh, you know you kind of mentioned previously uh, that that industrial doesn't have uh, doesn't deal with gross ups typically and, and can you just kind of explain why briefly Sure. We, um, we, we do deal with gross ups, but in a much smaller scale. Um, so typically our gross ups have to do with um, very specific, maybe like management fees or administrative fees. Since um, most industrial leases are triple net leases, <clears throat> the tenant is paying for a lot of those costs. For example, like janitorial, they're paying for that directly. Um, so it's not a function of the operating expenses for the building as a whole. 
And I think it's important to um, clarify here that of, of what what does a, a gross up apply to? Does it apply to, and I, Bill, I know you can answer this question. Does it apply to all of our operating expenses or is it just very, very select number of operating expenses? Well, it should be any expenses that vary with occupancy. And, um, you know, there are some that are pretty typical. Uh, janitorial, as I mentioned, electricity is another typical one, management fees is as well. But I've also seen any number of other expenses grossed up on some basis. I've even seen some models that assign a variability factor to different expenses, and then that percentage of that expense is grossed up. So um, it, it can vary quite a bit, but the intent is that it is for expenses that do vary with occupancy, and to the extent they vary with occupancy. Mm -hmm. Well, the Tony, we wanted to kind of talk to you also about now with COVID, I think something that people haven't really quite taken a lot of time to kind of think through is what does occupied space mean? Does it mean they have to be physically there? Do they have to, does the space have to be leased? Can you kind of talk about that and, and, and what you're seeing now as it relates to kind of the industry and, and, and what people are talking about? So, yeah, so this is, this is a, a really good question that no one really focused on a whole lot uh, before COVID. Uh, fortunately, there's a uh, Quite a bit of case law, uh, it's not necessarily when it comes to uh, operating expense gross ups, but when it comes to what does occupancy mean. And if you if your lease does not say anything, uh, typically the language that uh, or typically what the term occupancy means is that uh, the tenant has the right to occupy the space. So if your tenant has the right to occupy, but maybe they're not there, uh, um, from a common law perspective, that's going to be considered occupancy. However, a lot of leases, um, especially ones that get heavily negotiated, I, I think, frankly, most of the landlord-friendly off-the-shelf leases are probably not going to deviate from that standard, you know, common law definition. And, and um, let me make clear, when I say common law, I'm talking about uh, law that's made through lawsuits, you know, judge-made law. So if there's a dispute about what, what occupancy means, what, have, what do the courts say about it? And so when I say common law, that's what I'm referring to. And uh, as I was saying, that most leases do not deviate from that. However, a lot of times when you've got sophisticated tenant, tenants and sophisticated tenants counsel, they will go in and they will say, yeah, but what if the tenant isn't actually there? Um, you know, or what if they are only there uh, in occupying? Like to Bill's example, uh, if, there's, if, if the one tenant has 50% of the building, maybe they're only occupying 10% of their space. Uh, is that truly occupancy for the for purposes of the gross up clause? And so from that perspective, you really have to look closely at what your lease language says and to see if there's going to be any restrictions or prohibitions about your ability to gross up expenses during COVID, or, or not just during COVID, but, but uh, for, for any time. Uh, but I got to tell you, we've looked at some of these leases, um, one in particular where the tenant was griping about the fact that uh, the building was was nearly empty um, because of COVID, although it was it was pretty well leased up, and um, and the tenant was challenging the operating expense uh, language. However, um, the landlord had been doing it that way for about eight or nine years, and so the uh, the the argument we made back to the tenant was well. Yes, you're right, but uh, you guys have accepted uh, the way we've been calculating this for for several years. You've you've even done a, they even did a audit in the prior year. And they never said anything about the way we did it, and so we uh, kind of went back at them with this uh, course of conduct type of argument that said that uh, you know they they almost waived the right to complain about it. Um, the tenant obviously didn't like that excuse, uh, didn't like that that uh, that defense, and so we were able to come up with a resolution, but. Um, it, it got. It was almost going to be a very sticky um, uh, uh, scenario because it was a, it was a pretty big tenant. It was, it was a national credit tenant that we we had this uh, this issue with. So I hope that makes sense. That it, I hope I didn't uh, didn't lose anybody. I, I think you touched on something that probably a lot of owners and, and managers are having to, to to do over the last the course of the last year, and that is. Is, is we're really having to sit down and kind of negotiate some things that were really never talked about before and kind of working with each other for kind of a kind of 
a mutual benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And and um, is that something you're kind of people are are you know being considerate and understanding of what's happening and really trying to work together? Well, you know, it's it's funny. Um, y y yes and no. I'll tell you a couple of the you know last March, April, May, we had some a lot of tenants come come to us for rent relief, and we work with them. And now they're looking at their operating expenses and they're starting to complain about those. And uh, we said, well, look, uh, you know, uh, we would expect that you would work with us on this since we worked with you last, you know, last year, uh, in good faith to, you know, be good, be good business partners with you. And frankly, I, a lot of tenants have um, have responded well to that. You know, it's, it's funny how how tenants' memories uh, fade, right? You, what have you done for me lately? Uh, but we've actually had a couple that have been uh, fairly difficult, obnoxious about it, where they were like, you know what, that was then, this is now, the lease, the lease says what it says, um, and so we're not going to, you know, we're going to, you know, draw a hard line. Uh, but but for the most part, we've seen people be pretty, uh, um, uh, pretty amenable about this. Um, and it's, we've even had a few people come back, a few tenants come back and say, you know what, the property management team, like, went above and beyond what they what they would have expected, um, and, you know, in, in, keep in mind, in the early stages of the RONA, um, you know, we were still trying to get the thing figured out, and people were going into the office, the property managers were going to the office trying to get the, to, uh, the buildings ready for occupancy and reentry, and uh, almost putting their, their, their health at risk. Uh, and so a lot of tenants really remember that and really, um, uh, you know, were sympathetic to, to us when we went back on this issue. Mm -hmm. But so I, I, I do want to, real quick, uh, uh, Bill mentioned one thing, uh, not to cut off where I just cut off, but um, a lot of leases don't have uh, any type of gross up language, and uh, the question is, can you try and do that um, out of fairness? Um, you, you can if the, le if the tenant uh, goes for it, but you don't really have the right absence the uh, the lease uh, language to do that. Uh, last year when we were doing some of these uh, uh, rent abatement deferrals, we ad actually uh, added gross up language in there because we knew this issue was coming, uh, but a lot of times you just you can't always get that done. So, uh, but be careful about trying to um, impose a gross up clause if the lease doesn't allow for it because the tenant challenges it. You may not get away with it. Um, there is a uh, there is a uh, property code section. Uh, it's section ninety three point zero one two of the Texas Property Code that basically says that. For every expense you charge your tenant, there has to be express language in the lease about the charge or about how the charge is calculated. So if you don't have the language in your lease, if the tenant doesn't doesn't you know agree to it, not only could you be in breach of contract, but you could be in violation of the property code. So just some food for thought. So I know that uh, people are experiencing or are impacted. COVID has impacted. Uh, different product types in different ways and I wanted to talk about how how we've how the different how medical office industrial um, how each kind of if, if you guys could kind of talk about what you're seeing in terms of occupancy uh, what maybe maybe kind of early on and kind of what the trends are and what you think are going to kind of uh, continue if, if you're going to see if you think that uh, you know has leasing kind of calmed down or quieted I know industrial um, has been uh, less impacted. Uh, so anyways, I wanted to kind of just talk about that. Christy, can I start off with you? Can you let us know kind of, what have you seen in terms of occupancy and kind of what do you think is going to kind of continue going forward in the next year? Sure. Um, so industrial, um, I would say its main benefit is that it has the ability to switch. So if you, for example, are an industrial tenant and you make widget A and the market decides they don't want widget A anymore, you can usually switch pretty quickly to either storage or making a different kind of widget. So that makes it um, really nice. I know a lot of my um, tenants all of a sudden started storing masks and different equipment that they was not part of their core business because it was something they could easily pivot to. So industrial on the whole has, um, really uh, fared very well um, through the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, Vicki, what, uh, what, how is, how's medical office doing these days? 
have you guys seen kind of an uptick in occupancy? Um, uh, we have not, <laughs> um, but it's been pretty steady. I will say through COVID, um, initially it was rough when, you know, everything got shut down. So most of the medical office buildings were specialty physicians. So when all that was shut down immediately, um, that was a pretty big impact on that group. But it was short-lived um, compared to a lot of the other sectors in our industry. Um, one thing that, that I think helped some of the physicians was uh, the lifting some of the restrictions on being able to do telemed. That helped in some sectors. Um, but we have seen, um, you know, a lot of them are back in a, a lesser capacity just because of the restrictions on how many people can be in a waiting room and um, the social distancing factor of it. Um, Leasing-wise, I think that um, it's been pretty slow, and a lot of physicians are concerned um, and won't and don't want to sign long-term leases or wanting to do a one-year kind of to see what's going to happen with the CARES Act. And um, I think they're, they're, they're probably not as concerned as on the COVID side as what's going to happen uh, with the CARES Act with their leasing. Um, it has slowed down, um, but we also are seeing some of the physicians are either retiring or they're joining larger groups. Uh, larger practice groups to be able to sustain uh, the, the slowdown in their business. And and Bill, um, what are you seeing in office? Because uh, I know that the the subtenant space has gone up in in especially the, the Dallas market. Um, but what are you seeing? Yeah, so um, I, I would say what we've seen is that um, the the uh, rent collection and the leases have uh, been strong, and by that I mean 90 plus percent on the rent collection overall, allowing for some tenants that needed some rent deferment, um, in some cases workouts. Fortunately so far, and I feel like I should knock on wood, not too many, you know, just failures of, of tenants. Um, uh, however, the occupancy itself, we've seen it be, you know, call it 20 percent on average, and um, in general, the large tenants have not been back, but the smaller tenants have, and so depending on the building, you know, there's some buildings that are only 10 or 20 percent occupied, uh, but there's some that are 50 or even 80 percent occupied if they have mostly small tenants or, or something like that. So, so, so that has varied somewhat, but, you know, again, I would say for the most part, it's more like a 20 percent average on the office side. And, you know, that's, that's good that tenants are honoring their leases for the most part and so forth, but at the same time, I think the leasing uh, philosophy has been way off. I think, uh, you know, tenants, we've seen them deferring decisions on, on leases and so forth, and, and, we've, and we've, we've seen um, most haven't um, expressed too strong an opinion, but there have been some that have said, yeah, we don't, we've decided we don't need our space, we can be fully remote. That's been a small number. Um, some have wanted to sublease, uh, more have wanted to, you know, look at potentially reducing their space, but, you know, a lot of uncertainty out there. But the good thing is, I would say that since the new year started, we have seen the leasing velocity pick up, so that's a that's a good sign, and hopefully that continues. So I know several of my own tenant, owner occupants, they, they have had to spend a lot of money on COVID making their, their spaces COVID friendly, kind of more pandemic friendly, you know, putting up uh, plastic barriers, um, distancing desks more. And I know that we're having to do that on our end in some capacity. And so I really wanted to talk about um, and discuss the considerations and the financial impacts on, on, on how COVID has increased or possibly decreased our operating expenses. So as far as, Vicki, I'll start with you, um, cleaning. What have you seen in terms of, you know, reduced or increased operating expenses for, for janitorial, uh, for, for, for janitorial cleaning, disinfectant? What are you seeing in terms of the common area versus, uh, you know, as we've had reduced occupancy, we're gonna be, obviously we're disinfecting common areas, but with a reduced physical occupancy, have we have we had to step 
down? Have you had to step down on actually cleaning tenant spaces? Um, and so as far as cleaning, what are you seeing and, and what are you guys, what's, what's kind of evolved and changed? Um, I would say with the cleaning, um, it really, we have not seen much of a, a big impact. Our, the tenant offices that shut down, shut down for probably less than two months. So we still have the obligation to keep their suites clean. Um, even if their capacity, their patient capacity was at 25%. So there was not really much change in that. Um, and the uptick on um, for COVID cleaning really has fallen on the tenants being healthcare providers. They, you know, they had more access and more hands-on uh, protocols as for tenants than I would imagine than uh, some of the other commercial and other industry uh, buildings. So janitorial has not been really a big swing for us. Mm -hmm. Bill, what about, now what, go ahead, Vicki, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to say uh, we probably have seen a, a, the biggest difference probably in just the utilities, and that's because medical office buildings can tend to be heavy on electric with MRI machines and mm -hmm. um, their equipment. So that's probably been a where we've dropped is in that utility sector. Mm -hmm. And and Bill, what about you as far as janitorial? Did you guys um, what did you see? You know, with with a with an average occupancy of twenty percent, did you have to reduce your nighttime cleaning? Did you suspend it at all over the course of the last year? Yeah, and you know, it, it's not too much different from what Vicky was just talking about. I'd say, I mean, to start with, you know, we we made a point of uh, reinforcing that the buildings are open, um, they're open for business, and you know, the services are there, etc. So um, certainly, there have been things that have gone down, expenses that have gone down, some types of cleaning have gone down. But on the other hand, we've done more common area cleaning and more, you know, sanitizing in the common areas and so forth. We've been careful. When, when there have been cases to try and get, you know, those billbacks to the tenants, direct billbacks, so that they're paying for the sanitization of their spaces when they have uh, cases in their space. And, and that's worked pretty well, and they've been cooperative and so forth. So um, so really on the cleaning side, it, it, it hasn't been a big difference for most buildings. Um, and really for most expenses, uh, again, I'll echo what Vicki just said, the utilities and especially is electricity is one area where, you know, we've seen more of a percentage difference versus um, the budget uh, and a decrease in most cases. So that's where we're really taking a close look at um, that expense. Do we gross up? Do we do a gross up that, you know, perhaps takes into account physical occupancy, not just the least occupancy? And, you know, that's where that BOMA publication um, that, that we mentioned comes in to play. They, they suggest something along that. And so we are factoring that in and, and taking a close look at that and, of course, you know, making sure that our clients are where in step with how they want to approach that as well. And, and this can, anybody can answer this. What about, uh, what about repairs and maintenance? What about HVAC modifications or, or changes? Are you having to increase certain maintenance items such as filtration? Are you adopting, last year we saw a huge push to start really um, thinking about air filtration and uh, uh, lighting. Are you, t are you thinking or are, are your owners and, and your groups thinking about that? Are you guys starting to adopt some of it? I know there was a lot of stuff that came out early on and, and my personal opinion was let's kind of, let's, let's see what's, Let's give it a little time. Let's vet the various options that we have available. So what are you guys seeing in terms of R&M, kind of the, the HVAC side and air, air filtration side? Well, I'll just say that um, as a filtration, we have uh, increased the uh, MERV rating. So if we can get up to MERV 13 or, or closer to that, um, you know, and it makes sense and it doesn't negatively impact the, uh, uh, the HVAC system and the pressurization and so forth, then, um, you know, we've, we've done that where we can. It, it really hasn't been a big hit to the expenses. Um, you know, those kinds of things have been pretty well absorbed within other things. So, you know, 
no, no overall change from that point of view. Are you uh, are you seeing tenant uh, an increase, or did you see an increase in tenants requesting um, uh, various air filtration measures? Uh, did you guys see anything like that? I'm thinking did. I know medical office is, um, is a little different. Um, you guys kind of have a, you know, especially hospital systems, um, they're more advanced in terms of your typical office, but what did you, what was being talked about at the time? Or yeah, continue? and so, so we deal both with, we, we're third party, so we, our clients are both hospital systems as well as your traditional REITs or healthcare REITs. Um, so, I think we were we we kind of jumped on it pretty quickly with our um, engineering department to to get the filters in. Being a medical office, there's a, a big push to make sure that we're doing everything uh, for the health of their patients. So we jumped on that pretty quickly and got those. I think when the initial shutdown, when uh, when they were not seeing patients, it was easier easier for us to get in their suites and change out filters. Uh, so we did that pretty quickly. Um, so we haven't really seen a lot of requests for those type of things because we implemented them. So, um, I, but I do agree with Bill that we really haven't seen any big swing. I think everything's with the things that we didn't have to do with it being unoccupied or less occupied, uh, kind of balanced that with the things that we had to add. Mm -hmm. And Christy, have you guys made any substantial changes in industrial? Has COVID impacted y'all's bottom, bottom uh, your your operating expenses? Have you guys uh, made any changes? No, uh, not so much. I'm sure the tenants had on their individual meters have seen some reduction as far as um, electricity used and items like that. I did have a couple of requests from tenants if it was okay if they added options to their HVAC units, but most of the staff that is considered essential is warehouse and most uh, industrial spaces, the warehouse is not air conditioned. What about security? Has anybody had to, I know when, when the, the, the occupancy dropped, I know that there was a lot of uh, people that, that were there, people were trying to cut costs. I know my owners in particular, we really talked about where can we reduce uh, because businesses started slowing down. Uh, where did you guys, uh, obviously utilities we've spoken about, but where, where were some of your efforts to reduce overall expenses? Um, did you reduce your security staff? Um, you know, I know that with cleaning, cleaning increase, but where, how were you able to offset that? Bill, what, what, uh, what did you guys see in office? I mean, it, it's really been, um, we, we've had a few expenses that have went up in some areas, but it's really balanced out. I mean, we've had, um, it, and it depends, of course, it's very building specific too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're talking about security, it depends on if you have man security, if it's 24 seven and what the visitor policy is and all kinds of things. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, just, it's just varied quite a bit. Um, Sorry, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it just sounds like it, it sounds like the general consensus is that it it's really kind of leveled out. Where where we increased in some expenses, we lowered in others. So it it seems like it it really hasn't been that significant. I know early on there was an uptick in in um, bringing in third party companies to do a lot of disinfectant of spaces, but with time, what I've seen and and please chime in is that people are really not wanting to do that anymore. They're not, they, they think that uh, it seems to be less, that they feel, uh, as people have kind of gotten back into the office, they're more comfortable, they, they're, um, I think some of the initial concerns have kind of subsided somewhat, um, and we're not really having to do the fogging devices. Um, and so where we, we saw that early on, we haven't really, at least for me, I haven't seen that continue. Um, they're just requesting kind of a, a nighttime uh, teams to come in, our, our typical janitorial company just to use disinfectant cleaner. Uh, that's at least what I've seen. I don't know if y'all have seen kind of the same kind of 
some some of the concerns have kind of subsided somewhat. Well, I mean, I can say that we still do the, the same things if a case comes up in terms of disinfecting and taking those extra steps. I think as opposed to a, 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 an outside company specializing, um, in a lot of cases the janitorial companies have, have been able to take those on pretty well. I mean, mm -hmm. doing their own sanitizing, you know, per recommended specs and so forth. And, um, you know, if we have day porters, they're typically doing a lot more wipe down sanitizing of common areas, things like that. And, you know, we have installed things like those uh, antiviral wraps on uh, door handles and overlays on elevator buttons and different things like that. Um, and, and I think those, those can help as well. Uh, but, but again, they haven't been enough of a bump in expenses to where we've had to make special allowances for it or something along those lines. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those kind of things just continue uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. So has there been, uh, so what are your, what are you guys seeing in terms of, or, or doing in terms of COVID related expenses and passing it through versus billing it back? What, uh, and I know Tony, um, that kind of, this is a kind of a question for you too. Uh, so when a tenant has a positive case, are you, what are you doing in terms of cleaning the disinfectant? What are you doing in terms of cleaning the common area versus going in and cleaning their space and who pays for what? Um, was that a well, question? I guess, that I guess I'm going to bring you, let me bring you in in a little bit, Tony, because um, because what if, because um, I think it's really, maybe Vicki, um, what are you, what are you doing in terms of who cleans the, the elevators? If a, if, the, if, a, if a tenant has a positive case, who pays for that, uh, the, the, the tenant space and then, but who pays for the common area? Yeah, I think what, what we've done, um, the tenants, a lot of the tenants have chosen uh, in, in the healthcare again to clean their spaces themselves um, and take on that responsibility. When we do that for them, we do build them back, um, but we do take on the cost or the building takes on the cost for the common areas. So that's, that's typically what we're seeing. Um, there's with some variance, but that's, I think that's generally the way it's being handled. And um, has anybody had an, uh, a situation? I know we had a building here at my office where a tenant yeah. flat out had a positive case and did not want to pay for COVID cleaning. Has anybody had a similar experience and, and what did they do? I guess we were one off. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that was actually, unusual. Yeah. Actually, we've, this is Tony. We've had a couple of situations come up, um, and it's come up not, not only when someone has tested positive, but just in the general sense. And, and here's where the tenant, some tenants have gotten creative. Um, and we see this a lot in, um, in retail and in, uh, in an office, we haven't seen it in the industrial for you know the reasons we talked about before. But um, the situation is where the lease requires the landlord to provide quote commercially reasonable janitorial services, and so the tenants are saying that um, you know with with the whole world you know it's a global pandemic, so the whole world has to do these extra cleaning um, uh, services, and therefore that has become the commercially reasonable norm. And therefore, the landlord should pay for these additional costs. Um, and so, we've actually had a, a, a few tenants make that argument. Um, and so, we were able to um, I mean, we were able to uh, push back on that, but we had to get a little creative. Um, in a couple instances, we had to rely on the force majeure clause in the lease. And in a couple, in one in instance, we actually uh, we had a couple of difficult tenants in that building, so we just created some new rules and regulations that we were permitted to do under our leases. And we were able to kind of um, fend off that, that argument. But it was a very creative argument by the tenants. Um, you know, that, you know, the, the, the new norm, so to speak, is that uh, if you're providing reasonable janitorial, that includes deep cleaning, deep cleaning if someone tests positive since there were thousands of people getting coronavirus on a daily basis. So, um, yeah, fun, fun stuff. Well, what are you, uh what are you starting to see 
change in terms of kind of lease negotiation or contract negotiation, you know, force majeure, insurance, business interruption, uh, default provisions. Is that, I think that's something that we're, please speak to that. What, what are you kind of beginning to see or have seen and, and do you think this is gonna change kind of permanently going yeah. forward? Yeah. Yes, I think I think there's a lot of changes uh, that have come up. For, for example, uh, you know most leases talk about uh, tenant require, uh, complying with all laws uh, or all legal requirements. And I think the problem we saw across the board ever since last last March is that uh, CDC requirements are not necessarily a law. It's uh, you know it's more of like a best practices type thing. Um, and so a lot of tenants push back and say, well, I don't have to do that because I'm not legally obligated to do so. Now, in, in other jurisdictions, uh, there were, uh, and even throughout Texas, you had some local governments uh, having, like, mandatory uh, requirements for businesses as far as cleaning, but you didn't see that across, across the board. And so what we're doing on a go-for basis, and this might sound like a silly thing, but when we're defining what the law is in a lease, we're saying that not only is it state, federal, and local laws, but it's also, uh, you know, recommendations by, you know, uh, health boards, uh, the CDC, and, and any other similar type of uh, uh, state or local um, uh, board or, um, uh, what am I trying to say, uh, board or, or uh, recommendation type of authority. We're seeing that. Another thing that we're seeing is uh, force majeure clauses. Um, we're making sure that the leases cover pandemics, but the one thing that that force majeure uh, was really kind of missing in a lot of leases. A lot of leases talk about defining force majeure, but they don't talk about how it works. So, for example, we had some re some tenants, like some restaurant tenants, that said, "Well, I'm not going to pay rent because force majeure, I, I can't open, so therefore I'm off the hook for the rest of the lease." Uh, well, that's not really how that. What's that? Can you kind of explain real briefly what force majeure is for those of business? Yeah, so so it. force majeure is um, it's a it's a term it's a legal term of art that means that something is happening beyond your control, and in the legal con and so uh, your lease has in in the state of Texas your lease or your vendor contract has to expressly state that you can use force majeure as a defense, okay? And when I say defense, I mean it's a defense to performance. So, for example, most landlord-friendly leases say that the landlord is not liable for, um, for, for not performing if it's for, because of something beyond its control, if it's because of force majeure. And so, for example, if the landlord is obligated to uh, make some repair within 30 days and the, they can't get a part because it's not available in, within 45 days, that would be a defense to the landlord's default, okay? And so a lot of leases, uh, not all leases give the tenant a force majeure right. Uh, tenants, tenants council are now a lot more in tune to this issue, and so we're seeing a lot more pushback on it. But the lease has to expressly give the tenant the right to use force majeure as an excuse to pay rent or to make repairs or whatever. Um, and so you really have to look very, very closely at your lease language to see what rights it gives the tenant, if any. But the second issue is, um, let's say the lease says the tenant doesn't have to perform um, based on force majeure. And if force majeure includes something to do with a pandemic, then they might have an excuse. But but so so how long are they excused for? Uh, you know, if if for example, if you remember back in the early days of the Rona, the restaurants were only allowed to um, to open uh, for takeout and delivery. And so a lot of restaurant tenants were telling us, well, we can't open. Uh, we, we, you know, we can't have any customers because of force majeure. And we were saying, well, you, you can't have customers, just not in your, in your building. Um, but we had other tenants who were just not able to, uh, to open, period, because they just they weren't allowed. For example, uh, we had a, a couple tenants, I can't say who it is, but it's a national uh, company that does massage therapy. Um, 
and they were they were shut down. They could not open at all, and so they were using that as a as an excuse to uh, to not paying rent. And in some of their leases, they had that right. Um, and then when they were allowed to open back up, they were still trying to claim force majeure. Uh, they're thinking it was like a, a blanket excuse, like for the rest of the lease term. And so the the leases, unfortunately, we didn't draft them, but they uh, they did not clearly define how far the tenant can keep using that excuse. So we're really revising a lot of the leases going forward to not only clarify what what is force majeure from a tenant's perspective and how they actually invoke that defense. I hope I'm making sense. This is a, it's kind of a technical issue, so I hope this makes sense to, you, to everybody. Yes, no, it, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think, I think um, I've said it before, we could have a, uh, we could have entire series of seminars on the legal ramifications of COVID uh, on, you know, uh, not only on leases, but also on our contracts. I know we have been reviewing even our contract language uh, as it relates to, to kind of pandemic and, and how you ask your allies or your vendors to, to how, you know, what the expectations of them in terms of uh, performing on your properties. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. what, what about insurance? Is, is, are you starting to see any, any kind of a legal, um, um, is there any discussion around insurance or a building liability? So if, if, ha have you, are we starting to hear about landlords being held responsible if somebody gets COVID? Um, you know, we, um, uh, we haven't had, we've had a couple of, of threats about that, but we haven't really, we haven't really had anybody make a claim yet, um, ab about this. I have seen, there has been some, uh, across the country that we've, we've seen, but it's, um, it's one of those things where, um, it's, it's becoming so prevalent uh, that if you don't know what the coronavirus is by now, then there's not a whole lot the landlord can can do for you. But we we did see some there were some uh, some claims early on uh, where the tenant or tenants or invitees you know guests were making claims that they got they got coronavirus through um, you know through the building, and um, uh, and it was mostly we saw it in um, uh, in the retail context. Uh, we didn't see a whole lot. It, this, the articles and the cases that were reported were mostly in the retail context, not so much office or, or industrial. But the uh, there, there are hard cases for the plaintiff, for the for the tenant, or for the for the guest to make because you have to prove that the um, uh, you have to prove a lot of things, but you have to prove that you actually got it from the building, um, and so uh, and and from actually touching something if. If you got it because you were you went to the store, and somebody, you know, another guest breathed on, breathed on you, that's not that's not the store owner's fault. That's not the landlord's fault. You have to prove that you got it from actually touching something in that store, and that's a hard thing to do. Uh, uh, it's just it's just a very difficult thing to prove. Uh, you can speculate on it, but it's it's hard to prove. Especially, I think now a lot of the science that's coming out is saying it's it's a lot harder to catch uh, the virus. By touching something, um, uh, you know, initially everyone was like Cloroxing everything, uh, and then I think we've we're still doing that, but I think we've learned that that's not the easiest way to transmit, and so those cases have kind of uh, started tapering off, um, and I don't I don't know if we'll see a an uptick in that or not, but I I kind of doubt it. So it's a good question, really good question though. So you know, we, we kind of talked about 2020 expenses and how it impacted, but I kind of want to talk about 2021 and how it's impacting our operating expenses. Our, um, what are you seeing in terms of, what did you budget in terms of your insurance? Are you seeing insurance increase? Uh, Bill, I'll start with you. Uh, did you, as far as insurance, is that something that have you seen an impact, COVID impact insurance? Also, what about uh, capital improvements? Um, enhanced cleaning about, uh, you know, I know a lot of people spend a lot of time. It took us several months to get those sanitizer stands. Uh, in terms of like looking forward, 
are you making any modifications, elevator modifications, touchless devices? Uh, are, are people starting to kind of talk about that? And, and did you budget anything in this coming year for, uh, for any of those type of enhancements? Um, sure. So to start with insurance, haven't have not really seen anything COVID related. I mean, there's other impacts, including, you know, loss histories and so forth that have caused insurance uh, premiums to go up, but um, nothing that we've seen yet on the COVID side. Um, you know, with regard to um, the other items, um, there's definitely a move toward touchless um, fixtures of all kinds uh, to, and, and touchless technology for, you know, entering buildings and, and so forth. So I think, I mean, that's been a trend that's been out there to some extent anyway, and I think that's just, it's just getting accelerated with the, uh, mm -hmm. the desire here because after all, we had the flu, the pandemic, you know, of that kind before. So this isn't entirely new, but it's certainly on a whole new level. So I think all of those kinds of things are being um, accelerated. Uh, in addition, on, more on the capital side, typically, um, we have, we are in, in some cases installing things like UVC lighting in air handling units um, or bipolar ionization, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, there, there's been a lot of kind of look at those things. The, the UVC has been around longer and it's endorsed by ASHRAE. The bipolar hasn't been around long enough to get that yet, but, you know, they're looking at it. So um, those are some of the things we're, we're seeing and I expect there will be continued, um, you know, looks at, at, at those kinds of technologies and anything anything out there that, that makes sense that can help the just the overall cleanliness and even wellness of the properties. And, and Vicki, what about you guys? What uh, what's medical office doing? Are, are they uh, are they making any changes? Are they expanding what they've already kind of been doing in maybe some hospital environments and that they're kind of looking at uh, broadening that? I know UV lighting does um, is already used in hospital settings, but um, is there been any talk and kind of what is the industry then kind of considering? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a mixed bag of Really what Bill's talking about is that they are considering some of those things in capital. Um, the hospitals generally uh, handle all of that in themselves for the hospital. The MOBs are treated more like your, your general commercial building. So um, those owners, you know, they're looking at capital. I think on the insurance side, um, I know that, that that we budgeted for increases, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, probably about a 20% increase on insurance. I'm not sure how that all is, is uh, uh, working out right now on a building by building basis. I think one of the differences that may be uh, for the medical office buildings versus commercial um, is that they're they're typically much smaller, and so these owners have multiple, I mean, you know, hundreds, thousands of buildings, medical office buildings, four-story buildings. So it's a little bit different on the capital side because it's not just, you know, a, a million square foot or two million square foot building that they're trying to uh, retrofit. So it's um, really taking that stuff into consideration. But on the healthcare side, as well in these medical office buildings, a lot of the touchless stuff is already in place. Um, you know, your restrooms, um, with the exception of um, some of like the, the egress or the ingress areas. And I think that's something that's being talked about as well as potential. So one of the things that I learned when we were working through our uh, lead certification was the um, was not using blow dryers to use paper towels. I know this is really minor, but are, are people even talking about the difference between using the, the hand dryers versus uh, pulling paper towels? Have you all started seeing any of that just being discussed or, or moving away? I know, I know a, one of the things that have changed is like, think about uh, single use plastics. We stopped using, the, the, the industry was pushing towards cloth bags for grocery stores and now it's kind of gone back to using plastics for your or plastic bags for your for your groceries 
are, are, is there anything similar to that, like kind of the blow dryers or the hand, uh, the paper towels that maybe was kind of starting to become, um, you know, kind of trending and then kind of has reverted back? And Chrissy, go ahead, Bill, sorry. Well, um, I was just gonna, Mary, I was just gonna say, um, haven't seen too much of that. And in fact, one of the, I mean, the so the, so I think there's been more emphasis on the wellness, the interior wellness, and and, how, and health and that kind of thing, which in some ways that overlaps with lead and sustainability in general. However, for some of the examples you just gave, I think it you know it's put things on a pause as far as being more uh, sustainable. If we're talking about shifting from plastic to to you know paper, um, whether it's you know what what retail vendors use or, or what have you. Um, you know, at this point, they're just trying to survive. So, um, so it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag in my, you know, from what I've seen on, on those fronts. Mm -hmm. and, and Christy, are you seeing any changes for uh, in, uh, improvements in industrial? Are there any capital improvements people are starting to talk about or, or um, expenses that you guys can pass through that's kind of changed over the last year? Um, not so much. I mean, you know, utilities changed a little bit when there wasn't as many people in the office, but a few tenants have asked if they can add um, the various devices to the HVAC units for the office that will, you know, kind of work as air sanitizers. Um, and all that equipment seems um, reasonable. So we're allowing them to add a lot of that equipment, but nothing that we're having to take on as a capital project um, for the building as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I, that kind of really concludes the majority of my my questions for today. Um, is there any kind of final thoughts that you guys have that are relevant to kind of operating expenses and, and COVID and um, just kind of open it up to see if there's any any kind of last comments? I'll just um, add that, you know, um, we've tried to emphasize to uh, look at the bigger picture with this, um, you know, I mean, the idea is we, we, we need to administer the leases, but we also, you know, we want to be fair. Um, if we get too cute with the calculations and adjustments, you know, that could get us into trouble, I think. So mm -hmm. we're trying to, you know, look at what makes sense, make some extra adjustments. If, if it does make sense for buildings, as I said, really, um, in the most cases, what we've seen is the electricity is the one that dropped the most. So mm -hmm. taking an extra look at that, um, you know, and, and then, you know, hopefully these tenants are around for a long time. So um, we want, again, we want to be fair and, and do do what's reasonable and makes sense, which I would say is, is really the goal in most of these cases when we're talking about, you know, expense pass-throughs. Well, I really just want to say thank you, everybody. For Vicki, did you have one more? Oh, no, I was just going to just uh, tag off of what Bill said and, and we also are taking into consideration um, consistency because I know that that's that's something that that you need to consider making sure that we're consistent, you know, in what we're doing across the board as well as um, what we would continue to do and what we've done in the past. So, just wanted to add that. Okay, can I say, can I also just say one thing real quick before you leave, um, and not to be overly dramatic about it, but everyone. You know, we all we all cannot wait to get back to normal. Um, you know, no doubt. But I don't know that we will get back to normal when it comes to the the uh, the, the property management side. And I don't I don't know what the new normal is going to be. I don't think anyone does. But I just don't. I think we got to be. I mean, you know, we're really fortunate to be in an organization like this because you know we are the uh, you know the the people who are leading the charge here uh, as far as the new normal. And um, you know, it's it's really it's I think it's incumbent upon us to to uh, to be leaders in the industry because it's it's not going to go back to the way it was. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be better or worse. It's just going to be a new a new new normal. So I appreciate you know being a part of something like this and being a part of of Bowman Dallas because um, you know I feel confident that we're going to all all get through this and be better on the other side, whatever that is. Well, I'll say thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony, Bill, Vicki, Christy, uh, for, for joining us today. Thank you, Courtney, for uh, kind of putting all this together and, and Colleen for helping. Um, this has been um, wonderful. It's always great to kind of get together and be able to talk about 
what everybody is seeing in the industry and kind of get together and have a good powwow. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much for your time. What I wanted to just point out was a reference. There is a white paper that uh, we referenced earlier. It's, uh, it's, a, it's called the impact of COVID-19 on operating expense pass-throughs in commercial real estate. It is on the BOMA website or BOMA International website, just you can just go to the website and kind of, or just even Google it and you can find it. Uh, it's about 14 pages. It's pretty short and concise. And I think it's a pretty good uh, piece of information for, for property managers and owners to kind of look through. Uh, and then if uh, there's the, the document that, that Bill had put forward kind of using as an example, how gross ups work. Uh, if, if anybody needs that, we're please uh, shoot Colleen an email. We'll make sure we can, we can provide that to you. But other than that, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate again, you being here and um, have a great day.